Good afternoon. Welcome to Studio One on this Thursday, October 15th. I'm Tom Deering. Up ahead on this half hour, we'll be joined by, in the opinion of many, one of the most powerful political figures in the state of North Dakota, Majority Leader of the House, Earl Strinden. Also joining us in for a frenzied weekend of hockey, University of Minnesota Gopher head coach Doug Woog, discussing, among other things, rivalry and Olympic hockey. And on our Open Door segment, the subject of the award-winning movie, The Killing Fields, Dith Pran, notorious survivor of the Cambodian Holocaust. But first, with every edition of Studio, we go to the news desk with Courtney Bateman. Courtney? Thank you, Tom. Two men were stabbed in a fight in Grand Forks early today. Armando Zapata is in satisfactory condition in the United Hospital's intensive care unit, and Jesse Mendoza was treated and released. Police say they don't have much information about the stabbing, which took place at 1703 Demers about 3 o'clock this morning. They have one man in custody, but aren't releasing his name until charges are filed against him. Union Carbide and the University of North Dakota are trying to decide what's going to happen to some equipment at the Energy Research Center. Union Carbide has refused to pay for the equipment since a controversial PCB project was aborted, and UND has been left holding the bag. Studio One reporter Kristen Johnson takes a look at how the project developed and fell apart. The University of North Dakota is still trying to recover the costs from a proposed project to burn PCBs at the Energy Research Center, a project proposed by Union Carbide, which agreed to pay for it. PCBs are industrial byproducts and are cancer-causing. The ERC spent $543,000 refurbishing its gasifier, the only one in the U.S. that would accommodate the project. But public concern was that the project was being done in a residential area, and no one can guarantee it was 100% safe. That's where problems began. UND President Thomas Clifford said up to that point, the engineers involved thought it was reasonably safe. I think that the uh, energy research officials uh, were honest in their belief that this was not a harmful project. They fully relied on the permits that they had and they thought it could go. But the concerned citizens prompted the North Dakota Health Department to hold public hearings. At that point it came in and a decision had to be made and we stopped it to make sure that everything was okay and when the health department looked at it, they said, no, we're going to revoke our permit. That's when it all quit. The health department eventually revoked its permits. The project died, and Union Carbide refused to pay for the remodeling. The need of engineering in minds, Alan Fletcher, admits the ERC could have been a little more open about the project. Oh, I think so. Once, uh, once you see what, what has happened, you realize that you perhaps could have uh, uh, done things uh, in ways that would have satisfied people's concerns. Clifford also admits that in hindsight, the public hearing could have been held earlier before all the money was spent. Just what will happen is still up in the air. Fletcher is negotiating with Union Carbide, but no one is saying whether UND will recover the costs. For now, the expensive machine in this building is worthless. Kristen Johnson, Studio One News. An 18-month-old girl fell down an abandoned well in Midland, Texas yesterday. Rescuers are drilling through solid rock to get to her. They say they can hear her crying, and that's a good sign. And finally, the football strike may be over. There's still a lot of confusion and conflicting reports, but it, it appears players, and in some cases whole teams, are going back to practice. Some strikers are denying anything of the sort, but the players are apparently going to work under an extension of the old contract while a new one is being worked out. No word yet on exactly who will be playing in this weekend's games. Tom? You had to go through withdrawal during the strike? I've suffered through the strike, Tom. Rest assured, it's just about all over with, Courtney. After a brief fling with unseasonably mild weather, it looks like we're back on schedule for what mid-October is accustomed to. Meteorologist Jay Searles is here to give us a look at the weather. Jay? Thanks, Tom. As of 4 in the Grand Forks area, the sky is overcast, the temperature is 51 degrees, the winds are southeast at 8 miles per hour, and the relative humidity is 52 percent. Taking a look at the map across the nation today, a large area of high pressure off the east coast is keeping temperatures mild there this afternoon after a very cold start this morning. Temperatures were in the 30s, far, 30s as far down as northern Florida. Temperatures are now in the 60s and 70s and skies are clear. Across the southwest, an area of high pressure over the southern Rockies kept them cool this morning as well. Temperatures were in the 30s and 40s there. And now on the east coast, temperatures have climbed into the 60s and 70s, but coastal fog is now breaking out from Los Angeles up through Portland. In the central U.S., a large storm system has moved out of Nebraska and into southern Iowa. It is beginning to weaken, but it's still pre bringing pressing rain in through southern Minnesota and Wisconsin and fog over South Dakota and Nebraska. Temperatures in the region are pretty much in the 60s and 70s through south of the system and the 50s and 40s behind it. Another storm system out over Montana is spreading snow into central Saskatchewan and a cold front trails down through northern Montana and Wyoming through northern Nevada. 
These two storm systems will more merge over the night time tonight and will come in in southern central Minnesota as we'll see in the forecast. Temperatures are in the 30s and 40s over northern Minnesota and clouds are beginning to spread into our region. That's what it looks like across the country this afternoon. I'm meteorologist Jay Searles and I'll be back a little later with the Red River Valley weekend forecast. Tom? Okay, thank you Jay. Tomorrow night at the Chester Fritz, it's being billed as a night in Vienna, a gala concert performed by soloists and the legendary Montevani Orchestra. Music is drawn from Strauss, Schuberg, Mozart, and others with a variety of operettas, waltzes, and overtures. This is a one-performance-only event, again tomorrow night at 8.15. You can call the Chester Fritz for more ticket information. And if that doesn't quite give you your fill for culture, well, there's always Night Ranger, who will be in concert tonight at the Chester Fritz with an 8 o'clock start. Only a few balcony seats remain for that, however. When we return, we'll talk with Earl Strinden, right here on Studio One. How do you find out when an administration is corrupt? How do you find out when a government is hiding the truth? How do you find out about those who would like you not to find out? To become better informed about the role of a free press and how it protects your rights, contact the First Amendment Center. Do you like music? I do like music. Very much. Pick something groovy, Alex. Don't be a fool, Alex. Pick Audiophilia. The best concert show around. Every week, a new concert. Motown, rock, new music, folk, funk, and a whole lot more. Audiophilia, every week on MCTV. Swell. Welcome back. Welcome back. For many years, he has been recognized as one of the most knowledgeable and influential elected officials in North Dakota. Considered a strong, forceful, and controversial leader, Earl Strinden is the majority leader for the House of Representatives and executive director for the UND Alumni Association. Earl, it's good to have you with us. Good to be here. We appreciate you taking the time. Tell me, Earl, when we talk about traits of you being strong, aggressive, uh, forceful, even controversial, somewhat of a reflection of, of statewide politics, particularly when we think of East and West politics, uh, almost uncompromising. And yet those seem to be characteristics of uh, Earl Strindon. Do you feel that state legislatures, uh, uh, personalities are reflected in statewide politics? Well, of course you have to have personalities reflected, but uh, keep in mind in our system, uh, if you're going to be an effective legislator and you're going to be uh, a, a strong leader, you must be controversial. All the tugs and pulls of a free society surface in the legislative branch. Uh, if we have elected officials who are non-controversial, chances are they're not fulfilling their constitutional responsibilities. And all this business about power and influence, uh, my wife and children get quite a kick out of that because uh, I have little or no impact around the house. Must a, a politician have a, an extra sense of knowing when to be bullheaded and aggressive and when to kind of give and take? Well, the process, of course, demands compromise. And uh, the, the image that some have built for me of being uncompromising, of being uh, dictatorial, is not really the truth. Uh, an effective leader must sense the feel of the caucus and you only lead when you have others with you. The idea is to set responsible perimeters where if the compromises fall within those perimeters, you have a legislative program that you can live with and you can support. If they fall outside of those perimeters, uh, then of course you must go back to the drawing board. And uh, much of leadership is trust and confidence of your people. And you you'll never want to betray that. The trust of people. Are you often personally confronted with a balance between strong opinion and empathizing with the needs of people? Well, the system demands balance. If everyone gets what they want, uh, then we'll have a, a chaos. Uh, we must have balance, meaning that everybody is apt to fall short of what they think they should have. And that's the way it better be 
In fact, in the United States Congress, they better get around to balancing the budget or you young people are going to pay a tremendous penalty in years to come. It bothers me immensely. We must have the backbone and the courage to forget about momentary popularity and do what we know is right for the long run. We are not a democracy. We're a representative republic form of government. And those who are elected to represent and to carry out the policy of government and set the policy had better have a perspective of history and an understanding. And if we don't have that, I'm afraid history will judge us very badly. Quickly, do you, with the two positions you carry within the House of Representatives and also as a director of the Alumni Association, do you have a conflict of ideals when you want to see uh, a university excel with financial growth and then it's, it's conf conflicted with a, a legislative piece? How do you handle that? Balance. Uh, I, I could not be a leader for long if those who support me and follow me uh, lack confidence in my judgment. And certainly I'm in favor of education. I believe it's the number one priority for our nation, our investment in quality education. But also we must take care of those who need help. We must have a balance in what we allocate for other services that government is re required to provide. So it is all balance, and uh, that's exactly how I handle the matters of what we allocate for education. And in juggling the two jobs, you ever have time to jog? I do, don't, do you keep I don't, in shape? I don't jog anymore. I, I'd like to jog, but uh, uh, a knee gave out and a hip gave <laughs> out. A lot of people think that the first thing to go for uh, aging politicians is the mind. But uh, like with uh, punch drunk fighters, usually it's the legs, and my legs gave out as I was trying to keep in shape. Earl Strinden, thanks for joining All us. Right, it's right. been a real pleasure. Majority Leader of the House, Earl Strinden. When we come back, our open door segment, so don't go away. This week on the Golden Years of Television, it's the Jack Benny Show with guest star Humphrey Bogart. Really, I'm getting him fairly reasonably. <laughs> Bogey does a cigarette commercial. Pluckies taste bad. <laughs> Pressing the fresh and smooth. Lucky strike, lucky strike. Are you kidding? Throw that gun away, I'll show you a coward. Okay. <laughs> Don't miss the Golden Years of Television, all this week on NCTV. If you saw the award-winning movie, The Killing Fields, you no doubt were moved by the extraordinary true story of Dith Pran, a story of survival in war-torn Cambodia by one man's will to live. In 1975, when Phnom Penh fell into the hands of the Khmer Rouge, Pran joined the mass exodus into the interior of Cambodia. Held in a camp for four years, he finally escaped to the Thailand border. During this time, Cambodia became a grave for almost three million people. On our Open Door segment, Dith Pran discusses his life and crusade since. I, um, I enjoy with the public, but I'm really frustrated with the government around the world. They didn't pay attention at all. You see, we appeal uh, for the world to uh, sponsor, to bring uh, Khmer Rouge to the world court, and so far there's no response. You see how you feel when you, you know uh, that the Khmer Rouge are a killer. The Khmer Rouge kill uh, two to three million is nearly half of the total Cambodian population and the world uh, keep their mouth shut so but the public know what's going on the, the public also share uh, frustration with me but they try all their best they send a letter to the Congress uh, to the senator try to let the senator uh, know that the public have a big reaction want to help Cambodian people did for those that saw the movie, can you fill us in on the details of what happened from where the movie ended? Well, the movie uh, talk about my experience from the beginning, like you know that uh, during the Cambodian War that spilled over from Vietnam in 1970, I uh, became a journalist. I mean, I worked for the New York Times correspondent Sidney Shanberg. 
And then I really like that job because uh, I want uh, the world to know what's going on, uh, to, uh, to let the world uh, pick it up the story that we travel from one place to another, to refugee camp, and uh, to the hospital, and to the life of change during the war. And uh, that's why uh, you can see in the movie that we both decide to stay, and uh, I let my family uh, out with the American Embassy. So that's all our plan. We agree together because we both uh, like to cover the story. We believe that we've been covering this for a year. Why not when the war is over? If superpower leaders could experience what you experienced, would we live in a different type of world? Well, uh, you know, the superpower, because it's not happened to the country, so that's very hard uh, uh, to understand. Uh, it's always happened to the third world country, and uh, we like to uh, prevent uh, the next Holocaust. And uh, in order to prevent, we want all the three superpowers to get together and try to do something to stop this, because we feel that there's a uh, it's not easy to become a survivor. And, uh, you know, we lost uh, the many during the Holocaust. Uh, every time uh, uh, we heard about Holocaust, it happened to many people. Look at, uh, we lost a million of people in Armenian uh, story, and then the Jewish story is many million, and then to Cambodian people, we lost uh, so many. So we're afraid that it's going to happen again. We, you know, the world never thought that it will be happen again. And some people, they say, well, it never happened uh, to uh, this country, so who care? I mean, that's sin. I think that those people, they have one life. They want to live, so they want to, uh, the world to protect them. Because if they have a power to protect, they don't appeal to the world to help, because they have no power to protect. Uh, from these uh, crazy people. You never know when, and uh, usually I'm afraid that every, uh, you know, decade or 20 years there are some crazy uh, leader who believe that killing is uh, happiness. That's what we try to stop that belief. Are we in America too isolated or living too much in an unreality? Well, I think the public is different, but the government, I think, is completely uh, don't try to, uh, to, to promote that kind of story. American government helped the refugee, but it's not enough uh, what we expect. We thought that American would jump in and try to sponsor this because the American is the, the master of the uh, against uh, the violation of the human right. Uh, American is the master of who, the people who love freedom. But I found that American people is, is, is true. They love freedom. But the problem I find that American policy, there's some kind of, uh, uh, you don't see any fast enough to jump in and try uh, to, uh, to legalize uh, the uh, Cambodian Holocaust to become uh, uh, legal, to let the world know that in this planet there are Holocaust. Ever have any plans of going back to Cambodia? I want to see my country. I want to see my sister. And I hope that the world would try to uh, help and stop the war in Cambodia and try to bring Cambodia back to peace. One last question, maybe you've already answered it, if, if you could fantasize with me a little, if there was uh, the Killing Fields Part 2 and you could literally fulfill it, what would you want to do? How would you end the story? Well, I want to uh, get more about my life in the United States and uh, also the life of a refugee who were trapped in the camp uh, the alive are in limbo and they want badly help from the outside world. And I want to show more about uh, my uh, 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 feeling toward uh, those people 
and uh, how I felt. And uh, I wish that I could uh, ask the uh, American government to help and stop the war and try to convince them to find a peace so those people, they can find a future for their children. Dith Pran, survivor and now photographer for the New York Times. Tomorrow night, the curtain opens at the Winter Sports Center for Fighting Sioux Hockey. Now, you may need a program as the 87-88 Sioux skate with 10 new freshmen. They opened in their season successfully last weekend with a two-game sweep at Michigan Tech. This weekend, the Sioux faced the Minnesota Gophers, led by head coach Doug Woog. Meet him next on Studio One. Think for a minute. If every one of us gave just five hours a week, if we gave just 5% of what we earn to the causes we say we care about, it could add up to the biggest volunteer effort this country has ever seen. And we could accomplish things that right now we only dream about. Just five hours, just 5%. It's not that much to give, but what we could get back is immeasurable. Coming off a weekend sweep of their own, the Minnesota Gophers expect to be in the thick of the race for the WCHA title this year. Every year it's different players in different conditions, but always with a maroon and gold and head coach Doug Woog. Oh, it's intense hockey. Coach, it's good to have you with us. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate you taking the time. Well, it's nice to be here. What makes for a rivalry between UND and the U of M? Maybe it's the, the years of competition. Uh, they were playing a long time before I arrived in the scene, and Gino Gasparini has players, and and it seems like we're going to go on for a long time. And I do think, Tom, after, uh, after the middle of the season last year, we had a, the series we were tied, like 100 games, victories for each team. And so it's been such a balanced series uh, throughout the years. And, of course, that adds to the, the intenseness of it. Now, I know you skated with the Gophers back in the mid-60s. Is there, uh, have you ever played against Gino Gasparini? And is, is there any personal riff <laughs> that develops between coaches? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm too new. I'm, uh, I'm the rookie <laughs> on the block. You keep your mouth shut uh, when you're in Geno's area. Uh, we played against each other in, in the early 60s, but we've only coached for two years. And I think our records are, are fairly similar. We, we boxed them uh, two years ago and last year with Herkus and Joyce uh, and Belfour and Kid. They did a job on us. So it's been pretty even, but uh, I think uh, I certainly respect Geno and hopefully he does the same for myself. Now you're going in uh, as your third year as head coach. Year in, year out, you have a turnover of players, and this year is no exception. You're losing some by graduation, losing some to Olympic hockey. How does a coach measure successful progress with a constant turnover? Well, uh, I don't know how we measure it, but I know how the public measures it, <laughs> W's and L's, and, and uh, I think we've done a good job. Actually, our program, our hockey team at Minnesota, has won more games in collegiate hockey than any other team in the country for the last two years, so we're pretty happy with that. Uh, now we start a new season, and we've lost uh, the likes of John Blue, our goaltender, Tommy Chorsky, and David Snuggerud, and Todd Okerlin to the Olympic team, plus the graduates. And of course, that makes for, you know, uh, some large holes to fill. And, and we've got some young freshmen, and, and we talk about young freshmen. We're talking about 18-year-old freshmen, and, and we have a, a large number of them coming in this weekend. Uh, hopefully, we can compete, and, and I think it'll be a good series. Uh, uh, the veterans will will have those fires uh, kindling, and, and the youngsters will pick on fast. So. I think it'll be a good series. How do you advise your players? Now, you take a John Blue who's, who's skating with an Olympic team. You've been in that situation before as a coach, back in 84, being a part of the coaching staff of the 84 Olympic team. Is that changed now that you're a, you're a head coach, you don't want to lose any players? Do you see different sides now that you're in that situation? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I played on the national team in 67. Uh, my goal for all-time hockey was to, make the uh, was to make the Olympic team in 68. Didn't make it. Uh, big, big, uh, big void. Uh, as a coach, an assistant coach in 84, just came off the Canada Cup, the U.S. team, uh, this, this summer, late summer with Bob Johnson. And I don't think there can be a better thing than to represent your country. Uh, you can always come back and play college hockey, but I think that one time you get a chance to represent your country, it's the finest thing you can do. In your mind, how are we going to do in the 88 Olympics? Uh, Canada had a hard time with all of its great pros, uh, Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, Coffey, Messier, whatever you want to choose. They can hardly beat the Soviets. Uh, I think people have to be realistic. For Canada or the U.S. to, to get in a, go in a medal position would be an accomplishment, not just the gold. Let's talk about the University of Minnesota as a whole. Now, over the last couple years, and even recently, there has been uh, 
some developments with, with basketball, with football, uh, suspensions, criminal charges, the whole like. The U of M has had a, a bad image uh, to deal with. Can you, as a head coach in, in hockey, can you separate yourself from that? Or do you have to uh, deal with all the, the extras involved with that in terms of image and recruiting and down along the line? Well, I think people are, they get it in the news every day. Uh, there's something happening, it's a rape, there's a mugging, there's a robbery, there's, a, there's something good going on. And I, I think it's, uh, they know it's uh, certain individuals. Uh, when you're dealing with a large institution like Minnesota with 45 or 50,000 people, there are going to be some problems, uh, and their sports programs have lots of visibility. But I don't feel that uh, our name has been tarnished. Uh, the individuals involved uh, have discredited themselves and to some degree the university, but that happens, and, and you have a large city, and you have more crime. And, and so we don't like it. Uh, it. Maybe it focuses you back on, on why you're in college, what's supposed to be done. Uh, usually out of a bad situation, in a good program comes something very good. Mm -hmm. So I, I think those things, you know, we're adults. We realize that. Kids are going to make mistakes. We are in a kid's world. We're in the development stage of 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and things are going to happen. So uh, there's many good things that are taking place, and I think that's overriding the, the bad experience I had a year or two ago in basketball. Coach, thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Tom. It's good to have you with us, and well, good luck nice. this weekend. And well, just a little luck, right? Just a little luck, that's right. <laughs> Minnesota go for head coach Doug Woog. We'll be back with more Studio One after this. As if you needed to be reminded, but by the way, the Twins open up Game 1 of the World Series this Saturday at 7.30 p.m. in Minneapolis. If you're interested in tickets, just forget it. Nothing like a warm dome in October, as meteorologist Jay Searles will tell us about our forecast. Jay? Thank you, Tom. Taking a look at tomorrow's forecast map, that area of low pressure that was out in Montana has moved into the central United States and converged with that area of low pressure over Iowa. And a warm front will extend south of Superior down into central Minnesota. Temperatures will be quite warm over, south, over Wisconsin and southern, southeastern Minnesota. Cold front will trail down from southern Minnesota into the central U.S. Temperatures and, and will be cooler over North Dakota and southern Canada, with even some snow up over, Mon, over Manitoba and Ontario. Temperatures in our region, we can expect a low tomorrow morning of 35 with a chance of light rain. Taking a look at the forecast and the extent, tomorrow morning the low will be 35 degrees, the winds will be northerly at 5 to 15 miles per hour, and the skies will be cloudy. Tomorrow afternoon, cloudy winds will continue and, and we'll have a high near 45. And again, tomorrow night we'll still have cloudy skies with a chance of light snow as temperatures cool into the 20s and low 30s. Saturday will be in the mid 40s and Sunday will be cooler as the storm system moves through Saturday night and with temperatures in the 30s. That's the forecast. I'm meteorologist Jay Searles. Have a great weekend, Tom. Thanks, Jay. You too. We'd like to thank our guests Earl Strinan and Doug Woog for being with us today. From all of us here at Studio One, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.